that which I have greatly feared has come upon me. I will tell you I'm a human being like yourself, and I feel a great responsibility this morning. And I feel that God wants to speak to us this morning, and I, I want to yield to him. I want him to use me. But I realize I'm human, and I could come in his way. I remember some time ago, a man, and this man blessed my heart so much that I always wondered where he went. And I'd like to tell you a little story. We had a Christian day school. And on Monday mornings, we had someone come and share a devotional period with us children, something about God. Often there was a visitor come through and they'd ask him, would you come and speak in the school? And this man came there. He walked in there and he had his head hanging down. And he uh, stood there for a while, didn't have anything to say. And finally he said, I'm going to have to confess something to you. He said, there's something happened and I just did something real foolish. And he said, I have to just get, get this off my chest before I begin to speak. They, and then, then after he told us what happened, it was very, very simplistic, not, nothing big at all. And then he began to speak to us. He spoke in a stammering to tone. He could hardly speak. But I was only a little boy, and I was so impressed. I was so impressed by that man that I sat there and I listened to every word he said because I believed that this man was totally different from a lot of people I've ever seen. You know, he would come there to me as a child and confess to me he had a short, he had shortcoming. He was weak. And I want to tell you today, I'd like to tell you that I'm a weak person. And I'm not coming here to present to you me. If I was going to do that, I'd go home right now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be up here. But I want to tell you, there's a great God in heaven. He's got a message he wants to tell you. And, I, and he sent his son Jesus in the world just to die for us, to make it possible we could be his children. And I see the wonders of God and what he did for us. It makes me want to, to preach my heart out. Brother told me, he said before, he said, uh, Lord, he said, when you get up here and preach, preach as a dying man to dying people. It reminds me back some years ago, I was just uneasy. And I felt, I just felt like, I, I don't know what was going on, but I, I, I was just, uh, it was just something not right. And I began to pray. I said, God, what is it? What is it, God, you're trying to tell me? And I, I, I just cried out before him. And then these same words echoed in my mind. I, I must have read it somewhere. I don't know. I, I think someone else once said it. And these words, words came to me. I would preached a, a number of years by then. And it seemed like I'd become a little bit lukewarm. I began to be like, you know, I got up in front of the church and I, I feel I feel my place in. I did what I was supposed to do. I spoke, I, I spoke a message. But somehow I felt like I wasn't feeling the anointing of God. And, but then God said to me, it seemed like God was saying to me, Lloyd, Preach as a dying man to dying people. Another occasion, as I was, I was I again kind of slumped back into an indifferent stage in my preaching life. And when it, I just felt this tremendous, you know, uneasiness in me. I just didn't feel good. I just felt like something wasn't quite right. And I said, God, what is it? What is it, God? What are you trying to, wh wh why is it that there was a once that I had this tremendous burning in my heart to preach and to turn people to Christ. I said, why is it I don't feel this way anymore? It seemed like God was saying, you don't believe in hell. And I said, God, if I don't believe in hell, please. I said, please, God. I said, will you show me what hell is? And I said, show me, you know, and give me a message and I'll preach about hell. I don't know if ever before that I really preached on hell. But God gave me a message. God began to speak to my heart. He began to, began to show me these thousands and millions of people are going into hell without Jesus. That is really a place like hell, a terrible, awful place like hell. I, before the, the, the week I was going to preach, I was called to West Virginia to, to help to, um, to build a, a man's fireplace in his, in his cabin over in West Virginia. He was not a he was not a Mennonite. He was a man who claimed to be a Christian. I believe he was a Christian as far as he understood and knew. 
and he seemed like a very outstanding person. But he asked me, would you, would you go over to my cabin in West Virginia and build me a fireplace there? So I went over there. We was working on it. And while I was there, uh, we, we were building this, me and my sons. He said, I want you to stay here with me. I said, uh, he said, I want you to stay here tonight and stay overnight. I want you to tell, I want, I want to tell you a story. He said, Lloyd, he said, I, when I, I grew up in, these, in this West Virginia mountains, and he said it was a rough place. It was a terrible place. He said the people were sinful. They were ungodly. They were cursing, swearing people. They drank. They, they lived it up. And he said it was a horrible place to be. He said, I grew up in that, in that situation. And he said when my uncle died, he said it was one of the most horrible things I ever experienced in all my life. He said that that uncle of mine, when he died, he cursed and swore. He said, I'm going into hell. And he said he swore and cursed and, ra and raved in, in his dying. He screamed and shrieked. He said, I was a young man. He said, I went out. He went out from there. He said, I went out to seek God. He said, I went out and I prayed. I said, God, help me to find you. He said, I sought. He sought. I sought until I found him. I want to quote to you a poem. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but of empty dreams, for the soul is dead to slumbers, and life is not as it seems. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, dust returneth, what's not spoken of the soul. I want to tell you something. What it speaks in the Bible, but dust, thou art, dust shalt thou return, was not spoken of the soul. We say we believe that Jesus is coming again. We believe that we're going to die someday. But sometimes I look at ourselves and I say, it doesn't really look like it. You know, if we really believe this is our last day, would, would we be indifferent? Would we sit here indifferent? I don't believe so. And I don't believe when we walk by people that we couldn't stop and say, hey, do you know Jesus? And you talk to them. I believe you really knew this was the last day. But we say we believe Jesus is coming. And so this, this poetry says, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Life is not a dream. When I was, when I was a boy, we went to school. There was a little song we sang, a parched song. And this little song was a, went like this. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. I will tell you, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters and friends, life is not but a dream, but life is real and life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dost thou art dust returneth, what's not spoken of the soul? We're going to stand before God someday. And I want to tell you something. I, I think of, of discipleship and evangelization. And I thought, I prayed, and I said, God, how would I preach this message? I'd like to preach this message in one, two, three, and ABC motion where you can put me, can make notes and, and follow me up today. But today I, don't, I don't think you'll be able to do that very well. That's what God laid on my heart. I believe God is telling me to warn the people. He said to the prophets, he said, cry out aloud, warn the people of their sins. And I think the reason a lot of us don't have an interest in evangelization is because we did not just see the seriousness of life. And we didn't think about it, that our life is going to end very soon. I don't believe we're going to be here long. I believe life is, that the world is coming to the end according to all indicators. I believe we're pointing to the very last time, all the last of last. You know the Titanic, when it was, was steaming across the ocean from England, where it was coming from, big, mighty ship. That thing was, was elegant, beautiful ship. Nobody could sink it. Even the, even the man who built it said, not even God could sink it. Oh, have mercy on us. I believe a lot of us are sailing on the Titanic. We think we got a lot of time yet. I know before the year 2000, People, people said, oh, year 2000 is coming. When 2000 comes, there's something terrible going to happen. The, the, the computers are going to collapse. There's going to be a financial collapse. And everything's going to go wrong, and there's going to be chaos like you never saw. People were afraid. They bought thousands of generators, and they bought all kinds of food, and they stored it in their, in their, in their basements, and they tried to get rid of it for 2000. 2000 came and went. 
And one man told me, he said, you, you Mennonites are ignorant people. If you really knew what's coming, you'd, you, you, would, get your, you would get yourself a generator, and you'd get, you'd get yourself all kinds of stuff and put it in there. I said, look, I'm not concerned about that. I believe in God, and I'm ready to go. I, I'm not worried about all this stuff. My God's in control of all this stuff. I didn't have to go down to the gas station and fill my tank up yet before 2000. I didn't have to get me a generator and put it out there and, and, and lock it down and build a concrete thing around so nobody stole it from me. I didn't have to do that. I had a God in heaven who's in control of everything. I will tell you something. We have a great God. And he's coming someday. He's going to hold us accountable for our life that we live. I want to tell you, we're, he's going to hold us accountable. And I think we stop playing around, playing church. I get, I get frustrated. And I've been frustrated for many, number, number, many long years with the, with the splits among the churches and the church of Jesus Christ. And I say, what a horrible testimony to the world. Those who are dying and going to, into the world under Christ's grave. How can we fight together? <clears throat> I don't know where to go from here. There's something's on my mind. You know, we make all kinds of excuses. Jesus said, he gave an example of, of those who made excuses once the man invited people to supper. And he, they, and he said they began to make excuses. He, one says, he says, I bought some land. I've got to go observe. I've got to see what's, what, what's going on. I can't come. And the other one said, I, I bought me some, uh, some oxen. I've got to go check them out and see how these things work. I can't come. And the other one said, he said, he invited me and said, I can't come. I, I, I married me a wife. I can't come. And I think there's so many excuses why we can't evangelize, why we can't do things. I can't speak. That's what Moses said. He says, I, God told me, uh, Moses, I want you to go over here and I want you to deliver my people out of the land of bondage. And Moses said, oh, God. He said, I can't speak. I will tell you something. I, I felt that many times. I feel like I couldn't speak. I will tell you something about myself. I want to encourage you not to be afraid to talk to people. I was one of the most backward people. I sat in the corner as a little boy. I, when I at the recess, I'd run outside and run around to the, to, to the furnace room. I'd sit down in the corner there and I'd watch the ants because I was so afraid of everybody. And I was afraid of everything. I couldn't speak very well. And I'll tell you something. I asked a few questions. Just, just a, a crude example. Why in the English language is goose, the plural goose, is geese, but the plural moose is not meese? Why in the English language is the plural mouse mice, but the plural house is not heist? And there's so many things like that. You know, we can, we can squirrel the English, English language, and we can twist it around. We can, we can use other phrases I've never used before, and if use enough people use it, it becomes proper. So I'm, I'm not sure sometimes how to speak. I wasn't, good, I wasn't good in English. I was, I was, I was born in the southern region. And I'll tell you something happened to me some years ago. I've been ordained about 40 years. And I've been excited about Jesus. And not always, not always excited, but Jesus always, God always brought me back again. He get, again get that fire in my bones. But I was tempted, you know, when I was first ordained, I would pass out. I could, I'd get up here and I would tremble. I would tremble so bad I could hardly, hardly preach. But God, he, they, he used that. People listened to me. They saw, they saw I, had, I had to hold to the pulpit. One time I was holding there, and I, I, I guess I passed out. I was still standing right there holding that pulpit. So people said, I can't speak. I can't tell people. I can't talk to people about Jesus. I, I'm not able to. And Moses said, I can't speak. And so I, was, I, I grew up in the southern part of Virginia. And there were, it was a black section, African-American section. And they spoke a real tremendous heavy accent of something different. Anyway, that's where I grew up in. And when I go to preach when I was first ordained, people would say, I don't know, I, I, I about can't understand you because you got such a southern accent. I just can't hardly understand you. One place I preached, and I preached my heart out, and this one young, one young uh, 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 married man, he came up to me and said, I'll tell you what, he said, hey, I didn't understand a thing you said today. And he said, and he said, I, got, I acquired a splitting headache. <laughs> I said, oh my God. I said, what, what, what shall I do? You know, people can't even understand me. And, and so I pray, God, please, Lord, help me. 
Help me that I can speak that people can understand me. I, people don't say it as much now that I have a southern accent. I hope, I hope you can understand me. But I will tell you what, I believe that God can make you understand. You know what God told Moses? You, you make excuses and say, I can't, I can't speak to people. Moses said, I, I can't speak. What did God tell him? He said, have, have not I made your mouth? Didn't I create you? Didn't I make your mouth? I'm convinced he did. I'll tell you what. I'm a standing miracle that there's a living God and that he still lives today. Four years ago, I should have been dead. Three times I was out where I was out for a day. They had to fight for my life. They tried to put a needle in here. I was in intensive care for six weeks. They said I was full of cancer. They had a cancer down here, cancer up here. It looked like it was in my lungs. And I, got, I, I, and I acquired I had pneumonia so bad I could hardly breathe. And I was strangling to death. I couldn't swallow anymore. I couldn't eat food. I lost 70 pounds in a short while. And I was, a, I was a rack of bones. I should have been dead. You know, it, then because of this that cancer was up in here, I got a muscle disease or something like muscular dystrophy. And the, this muscle disease, they call myasthenia gravis. Whatever that is, it's a, it's a terrible thing, they say. They say, you'll stumble, you'll fall. You'll begin to see cross-eyed. You'll see, see double vision. There I lay in the hospital. Before I went to the hospital, this is how, this is how I walked. I walked like this holding my head because I couldn't hold my head up and wanted to fall down because I didn't have strength in my neck anymore. Well, I finally got so bad, I couldn't eat anymore. Then finally, I couldn't drink anymore. I told my wife, this is it, I'm finished. I can't drink, I can't eat, I'm finished. She took me to the hospital, took me to the emergency room. They rushed me in there and they tried to put needles in me. At one point, they tried to put needles, and they tried and tried to get my main artery up in here, and they tried to get in there, they couldn't get in there. I was just, I was like strangling to death. I was in terrible pain and, and strangling. They were trying to get it in. They were talking about, put the needle that way, put it that other way. And they were just gouging me and gouging me. I was in such terrible pain, I could hardly make it. And I was about to lose my, in my head. There I was laying. They couldn't get in, finally just laid it down and went away. I think they said, he, he, there's, no, there's no hope for him. We, we, can't, we can't get him back. But you know what? I'm here today. My, my wife, I told my wife one day, I said, I said, I said, Betty, please. I said, I'm tired. I said, please let me go. <laughs> they told me. If, if you live, you'll probably never be able to swallow again. They put a tube. They finally got a tube in here. They finally got a tube down in here. It got a needle into a main artery down in here. They began to feed and they began to do things they needed to do through a main artery down. My, my, my blood veins were trying to collapse on me. And everything was trying to stop. My heart was trying to stop. But you know what? God had to work for me. And I believe he intended that I would be here today. He wanted, he wanted to speak to you today. I believe he wanted, me to, that he wanted to use me to speak to you. And I'm amazed at that, that God would use me. I stand as a miracle before you. I have no more cancer. They said I have, if I lived, I'd have to take a medication for this muscle disease the rest, the rest of my life. It was, it was driving me crazy because those side effects was making me where I couldn't even think no more right. I told my wife, I said, please take it off of there. And people came like Joel and different ones, they prayed for me. It, it laid hands on me, it anointed me. And God, and through all the prayers, a lot of friends I had all over the place, I was, ra I was raised up out of that bed. And I was brought up, and, and here I am. One of the last time I went to talk to the doctor, said, you have no more cancers, no cancer, you know, we can, we can find. And, and they say, we don't understand this thing about the muscle disease, uh, because, you know, this is just so unusual, we, don't, we can't explain this. You should have been dead. There was no one believed that you, wouldn't be, that you wouldn't be dead. But God is a real God. He's a living God, my friend. He's a God today. He lives today. Hallelujah. So God calls us and he says, Jesus says this, Ye are the salt of the earth. If a salt has lost its savor, where which shall it be salted? I often thought about, you know, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. One day I was reading here in Matthew, the fifth chapter there, where it says, ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, where which shall it be salted? And I ask you today, how is it going to be salted? That's what God is saying. How is the world going to be salted? How are the people going to get a message if you don't take it to them? 
And if you don't share the, the right type of example, I think it's a serious thing that we band together in unity and we, we, we're, we, we fight forward for the, prop, for the cause of Christ. We go forward. We go forward with love for each other. We love each, each other intensely. That's what the Bible says, love each other fervently. Do you love your brothers and sister, sisters fervently? If you haven't, I believe either you're backslidden or you never slid forward. <sighs> Lord, have mercy on us. I want to tell you something. While I speak about this, or remind you again, Jesus is coming very soon. They say, you know, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of statistics or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what to call it. But they say from, from, Gen- from Genesis to the time of Noah, approximately 2,000 years. From, the time, from Noah to the time of Christ, approximately 2,000 years. And from then to now, another 2,000 years. And God has done things in sixes and then seven. And we believe it, it points to the end of time. And I believe we're running out of time. The, the clock is ticking away. It's going away, my friend. And soon it's going to be finished and done. And what have you done for the cause of Christ? Have you been the salt of the earth? Have you been evangelistic? Have you been a disciple of Jesus? Now, they spoke about discipleship. And I'd like to spoke today more about discipleship. But some, I, I, I have all these notes here. I've got stacks of notes that I've written out. I said, God, I want you to get a hold. I want you to speak. I want you to, I want you to get the people to get on fire for you. I want, them, I want them to see the necessity of speaking to people about Jesus. Oh, that I can make it real to you. That life is, the time is running out. Since I got up here, 15, 20 minutes, gone already. Gone for all of eternity, never to be reclaimed. I've said already, I've looked at the time, and I see that I don't have much time to speak anymore. I'd like to just grab that clock and squeeze it and choke it and say, stop a little bit. I want to speak some more, but I can't do it. Time is going away. I can look back to my childhood days, and I can think how I sat there, and how, how I played with my little, my little pet Fido, the, the dog. And I thought of things I would do. Never imagined time would fly away so fast, and here I am, almost to the end of my life. It's gone forever. What have I done for Jesus? Have I been excited about hearing that message that Jesus said? Jesus said, oh, he said this, he said, pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. I believe it was the cry of Jesus. Jesus gave his life. Jesus gave his life for us. He he suffered a terrible death. And it's a witness of one thing to me, two things it is that's a witness to me of. What is of God's hate for sin? Sin is an awful thing in the sight of God. And I think we all all, all should have a hate for sin, absolutely hate for sin. We should flee from it. Think what it did to Jesus. And when we talk about evangelization and guiding people to Christ, we need to take them back to Genesis and show them the most horrible thing that happened of all history. We're, we're there. It was a beautiful thing that took place. God created this beautiful garden, a beautiful paradise. He gave it to Adam and Eve, our first parents. He said, here it is. You can have it. It's yours. It's free. You live here, but there's one thing you can't do. Don't eat of that tree in the middle of the garden. The day you eat there, you shall surely die. But Satan came into the picture. And I'd like to, I'd like to spoke a lot of those different things about evangelization, what we need to think about, our vision of what, what Satan is and what God is, what sin is, and about the judgment of God. Of God. I'd like to spoke about those. I, I won't have time. <clears throat> but I'll tell you something. We need a proper vision of life and what took place in creation that men fell away from God because of the trick of Satan. We can go to Isaiah. We can go to Isaiah, and we can notice there the words of the prophecy speaking about Jesus, and it speaks about what he is to us. 
The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the, to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Oh, hallelujah. This is what Jesus came to do, to set at liberty those, about, those, those who are bound. What, are they, what were they bound to? I want to make clear to you they were bound to Satan. Satan played a trick on him. He fooled him. He's a liar. He's a thief. And I'll tell you, my friends, there's a lot of you. I think you're following him. You don't even know it. Have mercy. You take the Bible, you seek, and you seek after God. God says, I will, I will come to you, and I'll bless you. I will give you wonderful things if you will humble yourself and repent from your sins. And pray. Pray and seek my face. Pray and seek me. You are bound. A lot of you, I believe, are bound. You're led about round about Satan. You think you're a Christian. I think of, I think of Samson. Samson, he says... That he, he, he had this terrible, great strength he had. He had this assurance that God was with him. But he fooled, he played around with sin. He didn't mess around. He finally, <coughs> finally came down. He was tricked. And, and Delilah, I believe it was Delilah, that she enticed him. And she said, tell me, what is the secret? What is your strength? He said, finally, he, in, his, in his desperation, in his tired of her nagging him, she, he said, it's my hair. Ah, she knew she had him then. And that night she cut his hair. But in the morning, when she calls it, Samson, they're coming for you. He got up. He said he got up like he was, like he always was before. He, he wished not. The Spirit of God had left him. Oh, have mercy on us. If we play around with sin and we, and we, don't, we don't see the seriousness of sin, we don't witness to people, we don't tell people that, that God hates sin, the cross. I was telling you about the cross. One witness of the cross is this, that God hated sin. There was only one thing that had to be done. There had to be sacrifice made. It had to be the Son of God. It had to be Jesus himself. And Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Let it not my will be done, but not my will but thine be done. And I could, I could speak about that, how he went through those three times. He agonized in his spirit. He prayed. It was an agony because of a sin. We're in the garden when they took of that, of that fruit, that thing that they shouldn't have done. There was a death that took place that day. We were separated from God. That was the darkest, I believe, the darkest, one of the darkest things in all history when sin came into the world and separated man from God. They went and hid from the presence of God. But God today wants to reunite people with him. We as people should go out to cheer the world, tell the world about Jesus, and we tell them about the awful and pending judgment that's coming. We should tell them we should be the voice of God. We should be the voice that carries his message. Here recently, I was, about two years ago, I was, I was praying, I said, God, I said, I want a message from you. Would you please speak to me, Father? Would you give me a message to preach Sunday morning? I said, please, God, I want a message from you. I don't want to just fill in time. It's just like that. I felt a tremendous moving of God. This one word fell upon me. This was the word that came to me. Simple word. You'd be surprised what it was. Stewardship. Stewardship. God is a stewardship. And I talk with God. You know, I talk with him all the time. Me and him as friends. I was talking to him. I said, Lord, you know, I like to get excited. I like to jump around. I like to, you know, I like to beat the pulpit every now and then. I don't want to beat this too, too small here. But, but I, I like to beat the pulpit. I like to stomp my feet, you know. I like to get people's attention. I want to wake him up. Well, anyway, so I'm, God's just preaching on stewardship. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this because people will fall asleep. I said, how, how am I going to keep them awake? You know, well, Lord, I said, well, can you show me what I should use? Just like that, a verse fell on me. I didn't know it was in the Bible. I wasn't sure if that was Charles Spurgeon or if that was somebody else said that little statement. But I, was, I, felt, I felt sure in my heart it was, it was God speaking to me, wherever it came from. But it came from Peter. First Peter, I think, the fourth chapter, about the ninth verse. He says, there it says, it says this. These are the words that fell from heaven upon me. Stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
And oh, I tell you, it got a hold of me. I got so excited, I could hardly, I could hardly hold myself. I was, I was really, really, really in church right then and preached a message. I, I felt God's anointing on me. I, I felt my hair start to like crawl. And my skin was just like, I mean, my skin was crawling. And I wanted to go to church and preach on stewardship. And I, I told the people that Sunday, I shouted and I, I, I carried on. I told the people, I said, why did we miss it? We're stewards. I said, we're stewards of the manifold grace of God. The big, big grace of God is so big. You can't imagine how big that grace is. And it's the grace. Oh, the grace of God. Jesus, he died on the cross. And it takes care of all of our sins. Oh, hallelujah. And I said, we, we, we walk around like we don't have anything to do, you know. But we're stewards of the manifold grace of God. How can we be so indifferent? We're stewards of that grace. Oh, that grace. To go out and preach and evangelize the world and disciple them. And I'll tell you something. Ha! That time's just getting away from me. I don't know what to do. But I, I, I don't know where to go from here. But I'll tell you what. We need to be serious about it. Time is running out. People are going to hell. Since I've been preaching here, thousands. Probably hundreds and thousands of people slipped in the Christless grave without Christ. That time I preached about here on Sunday morning. I said, I said, I told him, I said, I said, Sunday morning, we don't have, you didn't call me to preach a man, evangelistic message. You didn't ask me to give the invitation. But I said, God was speaking in my heart. And I said, I saw hell. And I saw as it was, exactly what it was. And I told, I told him about hell and the people were sitting, weeping. And I felt the, the Spirit of God speaking to the people. I said, if you could stand right here with me, look down here into hell, and you saw, the, you saw the people shrieking from hell. You saw them burning down there. You would say, Lord, scream, preach, stomp your feet, do what you want to, as long as you want to preach it, even though it's Sunday morning, preach it, give invitation, whatever you want to do. I want to tell you something. It's true. God told me it's true. People are going to go to hell, and what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Oh, God have mercy on us. Lord, help us that we can be on fire for Jesus. I remember speaking to a, a man. On the job one day, I, I, I'll tell you a little story. I was on the job. And I felt like God, he wanted me to speak to people, whatever, but he, he prompted me. You know, we often think, well, if God gives me special prompting, you know, we need, we need to listen to God. And I think often God speaks, and we don't hear him because we don't want to hear him. And then because we don't want to hear him, he don't speak anymore. Do you hear God speak? Do you have the Spirit of God living inside you? If you're not, if you don't have the Spirit of God living inside you, Paul said, you are none of his. If you can't sense the Spirit of God inside your life, you need to, you need to find him. You need to do something bad, it? But anyway, God spoke to me that day. And this man was cursing and swearing. He was a violent man. I was working on the job, and he was, he was beaten. He was down here doing some plumbing work, and he was beating on this thing. And he hit his thumb, and he cursed, and he swore. And every, every, every couple of sentences and words, he was using God's name in vain, and he was, he was using them so many times that I, I just almost, my skin was almost a crawl. I finally went over there. I thought I, I, made, I, I didn't know what to do. But I thought it's time to do something. I went over to him. He was kneeling down there. And I didn't know if he would, if he would jump on me like a tiger or not. But I went over there and I laid my hand on his shoulder. And I bent over him. I said, Frank, I said, if you don't quit damning, I said, you made me damned eternally. Then he got so mad, he began to scream and holler. He used, he used the Lord's name in vain. He said, I'm going down there in that place. He used the word. And he said, I'm going to be damned eternally. And he said, I don't care. He said, I'm going to be, dig I'm going to be digging the coals down there. Oh, God, I said, why did I talk to that man? Wasn't there a better way to talk to him? The devil said, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. And I walked away, and I felt like, well, I just, I just can't speak no more. i got to keep my mouth shut. You're just, the devil said, you're, you're really ignorant. You're really ignorant. You made that man mad. Well, so I, I went away. But a few days later, Frank got bit by a little tick, a little tiny tick. And that tick bit him. He got sick. He got Rocky Mountain tick fever. He ended up in the hospital, breathing in, in death, almost died. So close he come to death. <clears throat> he didn't die. But something happened to Frank in that hospital. Next time I saw him, Frank was a different man. 
He came to me, he said, Lord, he said, he said, pastor or preacher, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I'm a different man now. He said, something happened to me. Yeah, I knew what happened to him. He came to Jesus. He gave his life to the Lord. You know, I, I could have said, well, you know, I won't talk anymore. I shouldn't have done that. I, I praise God I said something to him. It gave him another chance, gave him another, another thought about eternity. I believe God sent that little tick to bite him. And so he said, I told my wife, I tried to tell my wife what happened. And she said, oh, yes, honey, I know. I know. What's, I, I, you went through something terrible there. She patted him on her. You went through something terrible. He said she didn't have no, the slightest idea what I was talking about. He said, I couldn't tell her. I was so overjoyed with what happened to me. I gave my heart to the Lord. Hallelujah. And Frank changed. The same man who cursed and swore. He was, he was known by everybody. Everybody knew how he, how he cursed and swore. No more cursing and swearing. It was gone. Frank was different. He was talking about Jesus. He was just excited about Jesus as he was smiling the other way. He was like Paul the Apostle. He was going. He was happy about Jesus. He's going for it. You know, he's happy about Jesus. But I want to tell you something. Satan wants to blind our eyes. That's his business. That's his business to blind our eyes. It says here in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, that it talks about how, that it talks about Jesus. This has been a little bit nuisance to me, but you know, it keeps me humble. Here it says in Isaiah 6 to 1, and I read that first verse. It says, to opening of the prison to them that are bound, bound by Satan, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Oh, he wants to set the people free. And will you help him? Will you be his mouthpiece? Will you be the salt of the earth? Will you be, as, as he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We've heard about that. Disciples walking with Jesus and being fishers of men. Are we going to be fishers of men? Or are we going to be fishers of wealth? And all that thing that's going to be fade away and go all in burn into everlasting hell. Do we love the world more than Jesus? Breaks my heart. I believe I'm tempted with the, with the same thing myself. The uncertainty of life. You know, I'm getting older. My health is, is, is very fragile. I, I'm surprised I'm able to stand as I am today. I believe that God gives this holy anointing upon me. And sometimes I get up and I feel I can hardly get up here. And God overwhelmed me with his power and he gives me strength. And I'm amazed myself that God gives me the strength. He's our living God. Go into all the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you until the end of the world. This is the promise of God. I will be with you when you go and do what I tell you to. You say, he says, go, and you, you want to say no. And then as, that, as brother, as brother uh, said, he said, well, it's not, it's not low if it's not go. Hey, lo, he will not be with you. And I agree with that. A lot of you probably feel, you probably feel destitute. You probably feel like there's something not quite right in your life. And I want to tell you, I want to call to you, I want to plead with you. Make that choice today. Recommit your life to the Lord and say, God, God, I sinned against you. I would like to tell one more story. I think I'm going to quit right now. It's time to quit. I, I, I think I missed the time. I, I think I was looking at time wrong. I'm sorry. If I get this story straight here. <clears throat> I, I think the devil would like to hinder me right now. 
I, I, I think he would like to stop this thing, but God is greater than he. He does this. He, 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 gets, he gets attention from God because God gets the attention. He, he tries to stop me. And so I will tell you, it's a serious thing to play around when God calls you. When he speaks to you and you don't hear him, you reject that. I want to tell you there comes a time when he'll call no more. He won't call anymore. I believe that God wants to speak to us. I, I, I think God is saying no. So I think we'll stop with that. Lord bless you. Seek the, the Lord with all your heart. Call upon him while he's nigh. Someday he won't be there. And Revelation says you'll hear his voice no more. God help us. God bless you.